Welcome to worship this evening at Sundays at 6. We are so glad that you have chosen to spend this half hour worshiping with us through music, through prayer, and through a little bit of scripture and reflection. Would you pray with me? Lord God of all the nations and all the worlds, Lord God of this world and the next, we thank you for the hope that we have in you. That sometimes when we feel like we have been buried, you show us that we are seeds waiting to spring forth in a spring that shall last forever. God, speak to us. Help us to live our lives dedicated to you, to loving our neighbors, and to the things that matter. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. My map wall in my house. <laughs> Some antique maps of the London Underground and San Francisco, Italy, Texas, New York, and the world. Maybe it's a good place to spend 2020 since we're not traveling. We can look at all the places that we remember. <laughs> Our scripture today talks about a multitude from every nation praising God. And it's maybe a strange way to end our series on thin places, or maybe it's the most perfect place to end. Because here, as we celebrate, we'll celebrate next Sunday, All Saints Day. This is a space where in worship, we are in the thinnest of places. We are gathered together with the saints, those ordinary saints that are praising God and can be our cheerleaders as we live lives of worship to God too. John writes, After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is on the throne, and, and to the Lamb. 
And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. on phrases sometimes and I don't even remember who it was that said them originally. This one may have come from a retreat or a sermon or just something that a teacher told me when I was younger. They said, don't be so heavenly minded that you're up to no earthly good. Don't be so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good. It's Something that has stuck with me, obviously, all these years, probably 20 or even maybe 30 years later. I had this in mind as I was reading through the scripture this week. What does thinking about the thin place of heaven really make any difference in our lives here on earth? <laughs> our lives full of school and work our lives full of loving our neighbors? I think sometimes we answer that question by saying, well, if we do all of our things well, if we go to church enough, if we give enough, if we love our neighbor enough, if we maybe, 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 maybe keep ourselves from getting into absolutely every internet dogfight that we can, then God will reward us by being in heaven when we die by hungering no more, thirsting no more, God guiding us in the thinnest of all thin places to the springs of the water of life. <laughs> I'm imagining just maybe a little bubbling brook and God getting close enough to touch our faces and to wipe any tear that appears from our eyes. We think sometimes, okay, well, we are of earthly good now, and then we get our heavenly reward. It's something that goes on and on. It's a refrain that is heard over and over in our songs that we sing sometimes, even songs that we have sung here tonight. I'll fly away, I'll fly away, when I die, hallelujah, bye and bye, I'll fly away. A couple years ago, I thought, man, that song is... I, I love the melody, I love the song, I love the way our band plays it, but man, I am not quite sure I like the message of this. 
like a bird from prison bars has flown. I'm like, I'm not quite sure I feel about this world like it's a prison. I'm not quite sure I feel about my body like it's a prison. I remember talking to one of my coworkers who was having health problems at the time. And she said, you know, the older I get, the more I can relate to that, to feeling like my body sometimes is a prison and I'm just longing to fly away and be with God. Maybe we have felt a little bit like we have been in prison bars <laughs> this past year, the past few months. And yet I think that sometimes thinking about heaven can not just give us an escapist kind of hope, like, well, I'm just gotta grit my teeth and do it now. Gotta eat my vegetables and then I get dessert. There was a study a couple, um, uh, years ago that measured people's self-control. They kind of gave children or adults uh, the option to like eat one marshmallow now or like wait and then eat multiple marshmallows later. It studied the different kinds of people. And I think sometimes this is the way we think about heaven. Well, you can eat your marshmallows now through rowdy living and doing everything for yourself, being a jerk, or you can eat your marshmallows later and have loads and loads of heavenly marshmallows. But what if heaven wasn't just the dessert at the end of our broccoli and liver and onions of being good in this life, whatever that means? What if thinking about heaven, what if keeping heaven, that map, that image before us could give us the strength and give us a model of what it's like to live life now. There is this phrase that I heard, I know I heard this one in seminary. It talked about, it says already and not yet. And it talks about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven as Jesus said. And, and he said, the kingdom of heaven is among you. It is with you. The kingdom of heaven was here because Jesus was here. And so Jesus kind of said, hey, you know this way that we will live in heaven? giving to others above yourself, worshiping the Lord, um, embracing a purity of heart that means that we value God over all of our money, over everything we could do with our bodies, living a life essentially of perfect love the way Jesus lived his life. It was kind of like Jesus was saying, the kingdom of heaven is here. That means you don't have to wait until you get there to start living the life of heaven here on earth. Maybe heaven isn't a place on earth as the song says, or maybe it is. <laughs> maybe it's waiting for us to have the strength to live it out. I love this thing that um, you do sometimes when you're excited to go on a trip. Have you ever done this where you will be like, well, I am going to Italy. And so I am going to eat all of the finest Italian food for three weeks previous. I'm going to learn Italian. I'm going to read up and listen to podcasts about Italy, about this history. I'm going to have nothing but gelato and cappuccino and cacio e pepe and really, really good pizza. Or, you know, you may brush up on your French, get the Duolingo app. Get your Rosetta Stone software. Read about um, Marie Antoinette and, you know, the French Revolution and all of those folks. Because the way where you are going, <laughs> you are so excited about where you are going that it sort of pervades every little bit of your everyday life now. From your friends that are really annoyed with hearing stories about Scotland or Sierra Leone or whatever. It's like you are not yet there, right? You're not yet physically in Paris or San Francisco or Italy, but you kind of are. <laughs> in an even more powerful way, that's like what Jesus invites us to, to live in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. It is obviously not totally here right now. That thin place, <laughs> even in our moments of feeling close to God, it's not totally here. 
We know it because our bodies break down. We know it because there is disease. We know it's not totally here because, you know, you get acne under your chin and hangnails on your toes. <laughs> your loved ones die. Your beloved pets get sick. People face evil and injustice and oppression. And as one of the compromands said this week, there are still cockroaches. That's a question they wanted to ask God. Why did these things exist? And yet, the idea of being in heaven someday, being in the new Jerusalem, as the Bible calls it, that heaven is going to come down to earth, actually, and that this whole world that we love so well and that drives us so crazy is going to be remade. You can hear it <laughs> in the scripture talks about the ones who are praising God, who are dressed in white. I imagine they have oxycleaned and Cloroxed and all of that stuff to all of their white robes. But did you hear what it says about them? They are the ones who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. The great ordeal. <laughs> The, the book of Revelation refers to the Christians that were martyred for their faith. I think sometimes we think that we are facing persecution when we're not really. <laughs> Maybe sometimes folks are just asking for equal treatment for their religion, religious beliefs or lack thereof. The early Christians actually did face persecution. They were asked to either worship Caesar and deny Christ or they were going to go to jail Sometimes under Nero or other emperors, they would even be killed. They would be dismissed from their jobs. And yet, so many of them said, no, I will not. Jesus is Lord and not the emperor. <laughs> Jesus is king. And Jesus, Jesus' kingdom is the kingdom that we are going to live in. It's like they could already see what was there. In the book of Acts, the very first martyr, Stephen, was killed by um, many of the Jewish leaders. At the time, it was kind of religion allied with politics, and that always makes a bit of a nasty mix, doesn't it? Stephen, right before he was killed, could look up and he said, I see the Son of God sitting at the right hand of the Father. He literally could see. <laughs> he had this vision of where he was going and it gave him the strength and the courage to live life now. So friends, I'm wondering this week, how does having this vision of where you are going, of the realist reality that ever was, the reality that all the evil things, all the sad things will come untrue, the real life fairy tale that God is remaking everything and making all things new, how will that give you strength to do what you need to do this week? To love your neighbors, to love God, maybe also to love yourself. I think sometimes it may give us strength because it reminds us of what really matters. <laughs> Someone reminded me recently that there is no segregated heaven. <laughs> that might seem both obvious and provocative, but there isn't. <laughs> There's not segregated heaven depending on race or gender, who like Duke or Carolina or state or someone else. There is no different heaven for people who like cilantro and people who know that it is the most vile thing to ever pass the lips of a human being. There is no Republican or Democrat or independent or libertarian or Green Party heaven. There is just one place, a great multitude. No one can count from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and the Lamb. Why are we trying to separate ourselves and divide ourselves? If we are going to live in such a way in heaven, why don't we get practice doing it now? <laughs> why not practice worshiping God now? Why not practice loving our neighbor now? Why not practice 
setting aside ourselves and our agendas and some of the things that we think are super, super important, but really probably will fade away when it's all said and done? Why don't we try seeking justice for the poor now, sharing our food now, giving of ourselves now, resting and taking care of our bodies by taking a Sabbath? <laughs> all of these things that will mark our life in heaven, why not start now? So friends, this week, and as you hear the band sing these songs that celebrate our hope, our hope of heaven, of the new Jerusalem, of the not yet, remember <laughs> that maybe heaven is called in some ways to be a place on earth, that we are called to be an appetizer of that place for the world that when they know that we are Christians by our love, we can be heavenly minded and also of a great amount of earthly good. Amen. Father, who art in heaven, sia santificato il tuo nome. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be restored. And they'll know.
permitting, we will be back live next Sunday. We are going to be moving throughout the fall and winter. Every Sunday, we're going to be gathering in South Channel Park on the water at 4 p.m. So if you've been used to saying, thinking Sunday's at 6, think Sunday's at 4. <laughs> Worship on the water at 4. And so we'd love to see you or, you know, at least the top half of your face. And so come out next Sunday, bring a friend. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen, friends. Thank you for worshiping with us. We are hoping that you will join us next week, weather permitting, at 4 p.m. And so we will see you next Sunday for Worship on the Water. Thank you.